All right, so welcome to PETV Presentations. This is going to be episode two. Today we have Michael Jordan joining us, the Bee Whisperer from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, he owns a bee friendly company, awesome guy. He does uh, courses with us. Uh, the first course is already online. You can go to learn.permethos.com and sign up for the RBs for me course. Uh, I was just in Wyoming with Michael and we filmed a lot of information. We got multiple courses out of it. So we're extremely happy to have Michael with us. He's got a ton of knowledge on beekeeping, everything you could want to know on beekeeping. Mike, welcome to the show. Go ahead and start your presentation whenever you're ready. So what we're going to talk about today is apiary setup. That uh, if you've taken the first course of bees are for me, it talked about if you can have them. Uh, Law-wise, uh, bee sting, glossary terms, your history and stuff like that. That if you've taken that, you're basically now, you've either decided, well, I just want to either help the bees by planting gardens and floral, or I'm going to get bees. And then you read a lot of books and the books are telling you, oh, these are, these are the types of setups that you can have. Uh, Langstroff beehives, uh, rosewood beehives, eco bee box beehives. You, you know, you, you pick out the system that you want, but they never really tell you like, how are you going to set up? Where are you gonna put your bees? So I've kind of put together a, a PowerPoint presentation that I give to people about what you're looking for to set up a, an area to build an apiary. So what we're gonna get right into is what we're looking for in a site. Uh, where am I going to put them? And what am I looking for? You're looking for a, splat, a flat spot with good drainage. Uh, you want something that's open to the morning sun and for doppel sun, so it hits it right on the front. You're looking for water sources, wind breaks. Uh, in some locations, you will be looking for shade towards the afternoon. You're going to look for feeding or food sources. And then one of the biggest things is basically safety for your hive setup and the things around it. Um, that's the big thing is safety. Um, when you work with, uh, with thousands of stinging insects, as it says over here, you're, you're always looking to be safe. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have uh, bee signs, right? Uh, have your beehive, do not open to approach. You should actually mark it. And if you're not at the location, if this isn't at your house and you have it out in a field, uh, outside of town or somebody else's farm, you know, you should set up your fencing and everything and have a sign of your name, your address, a quick way to contact you. It may not be your cell phone. You could put an email or something. That way if somebody comes by and they see your apiary destroyed or somebody working on it or somebody has questions, you might even build a business of people wanting to know if you're selling your honey locally. So putting up a warning signs that beehives do not approach is really good. As you can see, I got stung on the eye over there that uh, carry Benadryl. You should always have something on your site that you should leave there for a case of emergencies. Benadryl and vitamin C is something that always uh, is very necessary. You should keep uh, many varies of bee suits. Uh, I have the Calvin there that says, help BB run for your life. If you're down, you know, I have a uh, apiary 12 blocks from the state capital in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, everybody in between insurance companies, zoning, uh, city council members, this is the big thing, bees. You know, people are fearful of them. And, you know, we recommend that you place a hive out of sight. And we'll talk about visual barriers and stuff. You should keep, you know, I have beehives in my front yard, but I teach. So people already know who I am. They come by, they see eco box houses, top bar beehives, uh, Langstroth beehives. Uh, warrior hives so they, they come and they can see those in the front yard because we kind of go over them when I talk about them but out of sight out of mind and that's uh, some key stuff you should have your your facility where the bees are not in direct flight path over people walking that way they fly up over people and not right into them so safety is really big and you should really look at not only for safety for your house but the people around you that people don't like bees and they don't like beekeepers. Uh, every, you know, I'm allergic to bees. I don't know anybody in the world that's not allergic to bees. They have the same venom as a rattlesnake, just in a very small dose. So everybody's allergic to bees. Some of us just don't have the magic reaction that makes our throat swell up and, and to kill us. So I want you to remember out of sight, out of mind. 
and you want to keep them high enough to where they can actually see the 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 forage and stuff that they're going to be looking for. If you place your beehive in your garden, your garden is never going to see bees. Your bees, your, your bees have to be at least 15 to 20 feet away from your garden so that way they can see them. So that's something to think about right off the bat is, is your location for the safety aspect that you want them away from people and you want it to be accessible. So how are you going to set up your first beehive? The first thing you want to do is pick out the type of system that you're going to have with the system that comes with the type of beehive that you're going to have and the working of you're going to do it. So if you're using the rosewood beehive, you're going to be using the rosewood method or Langstroth method. If you're using top bar beekeeping, you're going to be using many different types of top bar. Weirheiser top bar, Kenya Heiser top bar, Sunheiser top bar. You have to develop their systems to work with that. So how do you set up your first hive? You want to find out what type of hive you're using and then incline them to use for your type of stands, hanging devices, or location. So we'll get right into that right now. So here's a photo. And this photo is like a breakdown of like what you're looking for on your site. You know, wind break. As you can see, if your wind's blowing in a certain direction, there's many ways to build a wind break. You can put it along your house your barn, along a fence, a brush line, a tree line. Uh, you, bees are small. You know, they're, they're gonna be the size of the first knuckle on your thumb. Well, not my thumb, but probably not most people's thumb. They're gonna be the size of your knuckle. And when the wind's blowing, sand, debris, rain, uh, it's like riding a motorcycle and people throwing paint cans at you or even Coke bottles at you and hitting you. So wind blowing all that debris makes it so the bees have trouble flying in, flying out. It disorients their uh, initial patterns to get out. So you need some sort of wind break. Afternoon shade, as you can see on that, on that slide, there's a tree, right? Towards the afternoon, you want the beehives to start cooling down in the summertime as much as possible, or the bees will stay out all night. And that hurts the clustering inside the beehives for feeding and keeping a regulated temperature. So you need something for afternoon shade. We talk about sun. Uh, between December 20th and December 30th is the least amount of sun. It's like a, a V that when the sun comes up, you want it to hit this pinpoint door on your beehive and then drift across. So if this is what the sun looks like between December 20th to 30th, this is what the sun's gonna look like in the summertime, it's gonna hit it from the side of the beehive to the front door, across to the side. So in the winter times where we're gonna set, so the sun hits the front entranceway to start warming that hive to get them to work or to warm them up enough to eat directly in, in, the, in the winter time. You're gonna need water. Bees drink a lot of water. Uh, they, they don't like clean water. They like it out of soaker hoses, bird baths and things like that. So as you can see there, water source pretty close to the beehives. A lot of uh, apiaries, when they come back from pollination runs, if they're not setting up water sources, they're putting them along uh, rivers, streams, and creeks, and by ponds. So, because bees drink a lot of water. You need a, a space to set up your hives. When I talk about a space, you need a place of egress that's flat, where the surface is able for you to walk on without tripping on rocks, debris, anything like that. So we have a cart, you should move stuff out of the way. You should set up these beehives where they're, they're facing the doppel sunlight, where the wind is a good break to have a shade towards the afternoon, and it's an even space to work on. Uh, flat spots with good drainage. Now, a lot of times, as you can see in this photo, this is not set on the ground. I'm a big fan of rooftop beekeeping. It uh, takes the flight pattern away from the ground and gets you in the air. So this is a deck that's built in the canopy tree line. You gotta remember bees are inclined already to be almost 30 to 50 feet in the air. That's their natural habitat. So this is a deck line that's been built, even, flat, well good spacing, away from everybody, right? Uh, bees build their comb with the horizontal build of gravity. 
if you tilt the beehive this way, they're still gonna be able to come straight. So think about that when you set up your beehive, you want everything to be level across the hive and you wanna tilt it at least an eighth of an inch forward to the doorway. That way if any water or anything gets in it, it runs to the doorway and runs out. Just a little bit of tilt. You don't want a lot. Uh, most sewer lines are an eighth inch per foot. So it's not a lot to make sewer run. So just tilting the beehive a little bit to have stuff run out the front's good. But you want everything to be set flat and straight. When you go to remove the frames out, if the comb's crooked, you're gonna pull a lot of the frames out. So you want everything to be flat and level. So that, because the bees are gonna build their comb straight up down like a pendulum. And that's how they build them, is they hook their legs together and they swing in the beehive, giving their adjustment to make that comb in that round shape like this. They make that pendulum and that's how they, they de design that build on those frames. So you need level ground. Put garden tiles down, pour some concrete, throw some rock, level down the ground where you're gonna work on, build a walkway like you see here. Uh, some of the better builds that I've seen are completely built extremely just for the bees themselves. So you're just trying to make this easier access for you and easier for the comb to be built for you to work with them. Because you don't wanna pull anything out of the hive and then trip and fall and fall into that beehive. I mean, there's 80,000 bees in there that are gonna be pissed. So that's part of the safety aspect is the nice level ground, easy for them to build. And you don't wanna, you know, if you've got where it's gonna build up water, put some trenching in, some French drains, get the water away so you're not standing in mud, right? You want a nice level, clean area for the flight path. And if you're putting your bees down close to the ground, you want that level playing field. So that way weeds and stuff aren't growing up and covering up the front entrances of your beehives. This is one of the best hive stands I think people can build. Uh, the sunlight's hitting the front part of the porch of these beehives. It's got shade, it's got windbreak, it's got hail damage report. If you can see it's off the ground so it's not having overgrowth come over the beehives. As you can see they're strapping, so they're strapping down the beehives for wind. This is a great looking setup right here. You can see it's got the foliage in the back for windbreak. Uh, this, this is something that you're kind of looking at. This type of setup and build is more expensive, but this is, this is what we're looking at. And we're looking at building it as a hive stand. So that's the one thing that we're gonna go over right now. We've went over kind of drainage, get a flat level surface, keep the water away, keep the water out of the beehives, and get a nice level area where the comb will build straight and where you can work the bees. And then you want to build a hive stand. Now there's many types of hive stands. Uh, the one clear over on your left is typical from build, buying from B companies. It has the little frame holders on the side. It's a little portable bench. It holds one beehive. Uh, I mean, it's, this, is, this is a typical thing if you want to buy them from Dannon, Man Lake, uh, Brushy Mean Bee Farm. I mean, there, there's a lot of vendors that, that, that supply something like this. The one right next to it is kind of like if you've ever been to Jack's place before he moved his bees away from his quail. This is what we set up is a single hive stand with a monitor bucket. And the monitor bucket basically is about 18 inches underneath the platform and then filled with used mortar oil. If it rains, rain won't, water won't get in the bucket. But if you have fire ants and mice and snakes, this is made that the, they'll go in that mud or oil bucket and not want to climb up the pole. So that's a pest mediation thing. But this is, this is a single hive stand. Uh, the one next to it with all the people, that is one of my favorite hive, hive stands. It's mobile, it's lightweight, and very sturdy. It's made to be sunk in the ground or you can put coffee cans on the legs and fill them up with motor oil. It's, it has a four by fours. You can stretch this as long as you want. And as you can see on the other end, basically that's what they're doing is they're stretching it very long. This is very stable and you're, you can take it down and move it. So you can move your bees off the stand, tear down that stand, move it to a no location, then move your bees back on it. Uh, that one's made by da, uh, Danielle Freeman from Freeman Family Farms with all the people around it. And that's, I, I really like that beehive. The one on your far right is a permanent location. 
with multiple stands. It's basically what you saw there, but it's got concrete foundation where the poles are stuck in the ground. You'll see us kind of doing the same thing in the Perma Ethos videos where we're using a clothesline, tops the T's from clothesline. That we've cut those and sunk those in the ground, welded angle iron on it to set up multiple mounts of beehives on it. This is a permanent location. This is something that you're probably not gonna tear down. But if you notice on all of these stands, we're looking at about 18 inches to the bottom of the beehive. They're almost all identical. Uh, I, that is one of the big things about getting your beehives off the ground, getting them out of the foliage. It gets them high enough where skunks, fox, badgers, uh, raccoons, anything has to stretch up to get to it. It exposes their face and underneath. So when the bees come right out, they can sting them. Uh, you want it high enough to where you're not bending over to grab the boxes because they're extremely heavy. So if you notice, these are all about mid-drift level where you can move and adequate and use them. You need to find a hive stand. Uh, if you're a commercial beekeeper, you're using pallets, and that's because you're loading them up on forklifts, and you're only a location a maximum of three months anyway, and you're moving them to maybe even a whole other state. Uh, cinder blocks are okay. We do show some video about using cinder blocks. The, the holes in the cinder blocks contain mice. They'll build nests. Beehives are warm. They'll get underneath there. They'll stay warm in the wintertime. They'll crawl up the posts or whatever, starting eating out the comb. Now you supplied them with a warm barrier and something to eat with. But I think if you're looking at these, these are the type of high stands that you're looking for. Or if we're looking back at the other one, right? If you could make something like this, this is super cool. This would be even something on a deck or on top of the roof of your house. Like I'm a, I'm a big fan of getting them up in the air. The higher they're up in the air, the less uh, problem you have with flight pattern. So you need to build a hive stand. You need to get the bees to where they're going to be stable, that you can strap them down, and they're not going to move. Especially if you live anywhere where you have cattle. They'll rub up on them. They'll push them over. So you want something that's pretty stable. You want something with easy access. Uh, this is not easy access. This is a lot of beehives on a cliff. This is something that I wouldn't do. <laughs> I'm too fat to be crawling around along with decking and stuff. So. I wouldn't be using it at all. Uh, if your hives are located or crowded, it's difficult to work in. Make sure you space your beehives, that you have at least two to three foot. That way, if you're moving your boxes down and onto the side, you're not setting them on each other. Give yourself a little bit of room. That way you can stay calm. Uh, you wanna be able to have a lot of room towards the back more than you do the front. Now, you're not going to work your beehives in the front because that's where the guard bees are and that's where they're going to be coming in and out of most of the time. So, you, But you want at least three foot of room. Uh, if you, you, you want to be able to work the bees without really squatting down. It says, you know, here that if you, have, if you have to stand and squat, you want to do it comfortably. Remember, you're going to be in a bee suit. So you're going to be all dressed up in a Tyvex like tight suit that's going to be really tight or bulky that's going to grab on tree limbs and stuff. So give yourself adequate room, easy access to your beehives. It's very important. You want flat space. If you're kneeling down, you're working with stuff because if people want to come and watch you work and do your stuff with your bees, you want them to be comfortable too. Hive orientation for the sun. Now there is a month in the year where it's the shortest amount of sunshine. We talked about that in the Northern hemisphere where we're at. It's between December 20th and December 30th. It's when it comes right out and the sun hits the front door and when the sun comes over the horizon. It's where it gets the right heat for the hive of the first off of the day. And we want this to be full sun. You're not always gonna get that when you're in a homestead or anything like that. That's something to think about. But if you're in an urban environment, you know, you try to get it to where at least they're gonna get ample sun right off of the first of the day. So if your hives are facing due south and the sun's coming up in the east, you might want to even cock them a little southeast. So that when the sun comes up, it's going to hit that front door. It's going to help bring the breeze in and the warmth into that beehive and help those bees in the type of winter. So orientation of the sun is very important. They're the wor worshipers of raw. Uh, that, bees are union workers. The flowers are mostly open when the sun's up anyway. You have very uh, a nightshade 
floral that comes out like you have moon flowers and stuff like that but its orientation of the sun is big They're, bees are union workers so you face the the hive door to the sun they the hive body you want them to have the sun because they have temperatures around 95 degrees and they do this by by moving their wings and stuff in there to keep the vibration going if they're tightly clustered they can't move they freeze and they start dropping less bees less heat your hive dies off so the more sun that they get the less amount of energy that's that that spins having to keep the hive warm in the winter months so placing your hive south or southeast in the morning the sun exposure expends this process and will help the hive earlier in the day to start warming up and that's the you know that's what we want we want to be able to let those bees uncluster a little bit and eat in the winter time but in the summertime like i said your v's not like this where the door is here at the bottom the sun comes up and hits the door and then this in the summertime you have a wider angle we want the bees out working we want them out drinking water we want them doing cleaning fights and pooping so we want them out as much as we can in the summertime but in the winter time we're trying to uh, accumulate heat as you can see here all these beehives have adequate spacing right they're all facing the same direction for the sunlight as you notice that there's so the snow's left on the beehives that's insulation right so there are some things when you do wintering that in an area of an urban environment like this you still want spacing you still want the sunlight to be able to hit the fronts of the beehives as much as possible and we leave the snow on the tops like that because that's like putting a stocking cap on your head keeps the heat from rising up out of your head so this is another barrier to try to keep the warmth in in the perma ethos course we talk about uh laying uh, shielding and stuff on the hive and that's more in depth for winterization but getting your sun orientation as you see all these are facing the same way they're not turned all different directions and different locations they're all the same way now we're going to talk about water on that first slide that you saw where we talked about streams and water beds uh, bees collect water to regulate the temperature in the hive they mix it with pollen and honey to make bee bread it's one of the effective ways that they used to uh, beehives are very humid on the inside uh, they're not going to try to fly a football field 50 yards to go get water they're going to go to your dog's uh, dish and get water they're going to look for bird baths mud puddles the neighbor's swimming pool if it's right real close you're going to hear about it from your neighbor he because he's going to be able to see them they're going to be coming over like a little cloud hitting the side of his pool and coming out and he's going to tell you that so you want to build something to to adequate water you can do it on a more natural method like there on the far left but if you want to build like your rain gutters to where you have a like a little pool full of rocks you're getting some of the natural water that comes off your roof you can even fill that up with water occasionally and move the bees to location uh, larger equipment if you have uh, you're not going to go out to your bee yard as much there's a 55 gallon drum a guy has a spigot on it's constantly dripping there's like a little peat drip it drips and it's filling up a little dish with the marbles you can see the marbles there at the bottom it just kind of keeps the water in there the bees can run across the marbles and collect water or a dog water dish now if you notice all of them have some sort of rock cork marbles uh, if you have open water the bees are going to drown so you want something that they can kind of land on and you're going to have to supply them with water uh, i have a, a crow creek that's uh, one block away and the bees are still going to a wheelbarrow that i have at my house that's full of debris that i throw water in uh, the water source should be about 15 feet away to 20 feet away Flight orientation from the bees is what we call 10 to 15 feet that they usually come out. It takes about 10 to 15 feet in the air, and that's a dome. So anything inside that dome, they're not going to go to. But if they're 15 feet out, they'll hit water. So, you know, if you, if you have water within 15 to 100 feet of your hive, you're doing pretty good. Um, I just know that... Uh, to attract the bees to the water, you should throw some lemongrass oil in there. Try to get something that smells good for them to get there. But bees like dirty water. Uh, they're not going to be looking for good, clean water. 
uh, you're going to see, like I said, in your dog dish and your dog slobbers and all kinds of stuff in the dish, bird baths, birds poop in it, mud puddles, uh, the swimming pool and stuff has chlorine and stuff in it. But if it's a close water source, they're going to hit it. So you need to put some water sources out. One that you don't see here and we teach in one of our classes is the five gallon bucket and solar panel. So you take a five gallon bucket and put a solar panel uh, water fountain in it. And you fill the bucket halfway, extending the tip of the fountain pump just about an inch above it. And then you put a screen over the top of it with some rocks. What happens is, as the water pumps up and sprays on the screen, it runs back down to the bucket circulating it. The screen stops evaporation a lot, but also allows the bees to walk in and down to where the water's hitting and accumulating on the rocks. And you can put those out there, it circulates the water a little bit, gets oxygen to the water, lets them smell the water in the air. And you can put these solar powered water buckets in a couple of locations and attract the bees right to them and control the bees a lot more. Controlling your bees and training them is something that you're gonna have to learn. People don't think you can do that. Uh, I've watched guys train bees to find landmines. By putting Simtex in the beehives, the bees get uh, acclimated to the smell of the Simtex or the phosphorus and the gunpowder. Then you release them in different places like Indonesia where they have minefields. The bees land on the mines because it's the same smell that they're used to and that helps them locate the mines. So you're going to be able to train your bees. So you're going to train them to learn about water. So this is a good way to start training them about water is putting a little lemongrass oil and setting up something that's out of pedestrian way and away from the public to where the bees are going to go where they're safe to get water. You don't want them in your dog dish, man. Your dog's going to swell up. So here's what we call a vial feeder, right? Uh, this is a small incline where the water just kind of drips out and goes down. You can also use this same thing with bee feed and do these troughs. Uh, I have seen potato cellars where people take their bees to winterize them underground in potato cellars. And they're, how do the bees get food and water? They take a pool table and cut the legs off one side so the pool table drops. And they put a, a bucket at the end and the bucket pumps the water up and then the water goes through a PVC tube with little holes and it runs down the felt down into the bucket where it pumps it up and the bees can land on the felt. You can do that with sugar water or just plain water and it gives a location where the bees can feed. So this is what a feeding plant looks like. Uh, this is something that uh, I thought was really cool to show you that you can get a long system going to feed the bees. There are a lot of things out there to feed and water your bees. I would really look into them. Uh, bees love dirty water. So this is the, with the wood and stuff. Wood soaks in the water. It helps them so the bees can get it. You're going to need water source for your bees. Okay, so adding wind barrier and protection. We talked about like putting them up against your house, uh, against tree lines and stuff. But here's just a couple easy ways. And the top one, you see where the guys use the lattice around it? This is super cool. As you can see, the top part is open. So when the bees fly out, they hit towards the top and they fly out. When the bees come back to the screen, they can come underneath, they can go through the lattice a little bit, or they can come through the top. But from the street, you can't see his bees, right? This also makes it for when the bees come out to do their orientation flight, they fly out of the top and they fly out. If his beehives are facing the lattice, they fly out and they have to go up and out. So not only is this a good wind break, this is already training your bees for their flight pattern instead of the pedestrian walkway. And it's also doing coverage so people can't see your bees out of sight, out of mind. The other one is a wove fence. Uh, as you can see, he's got his enclosed. This is more of a safety precaution. He's got a long stand where he can put multiple hives in there. And he's got his windbreak and shade for the afternoon. So this is incorporating a lot. And this is just not getting your bees into a location where they get the sunlight and stuff. This is helping them with flight orientation. The bottom one's showing protection. The top one's showing out of sight, of my, out, of sight out of mind. And then variable windbreak. It's, it's ideal to have place the location that is protected from harsh winds. Like I said, uh, 
here in Wyoming, it's Katrina every day. In Katrina, when I donated beehives to rebuild bee, uh, apiaries in Louisiana after Katrina, they said, oh, the winds were 70 miles an hour. That's Tuesday here. I can't have a sun hive. A sun hive is a woven basket that's a top bar system, but it hangs like a pagoda, and it would just, it would just blow the bees to hell. So also in these structures, you see the bottom part, it's uh, on a stand and it's all in trap. You need to make sure that uh, you have weights on your beehive so they don't blow over or they get pushed over. Uh, we're big fans of strapping them down to the beehives and to the bee stands and then setting the bee hands on, stands into something strong. So I just wanna show you there are wind barriers that you can make and build. You can put these anywhere that you want, on a, outside your garden, on your roof of your house. Uh, like I said, think out of the box a little bit when it comes to it. And some of them are made for storms, like the one that they're at the rock base, right? If you look at it, it has an area that's at the bottom that has rocks, and then where it's a flat base, and then it has the wind break and shed, and a sun bear, uh, shade and everything. So that's a really good setup there. Feed for the bees. You're gonna have to feed your bees. If you don't have lavender fields like at the top, sunflowers or the almond fields, uh, right now I've got 50 degree weather in February in Wyoming and there ain't no flowers out. The bees aren't gonna work. So you're gonna have to feed your bees. Uh, I wanna let you know that if you read this right here, uh, I refuse to think that mother nature has less than the capable to feed the bees. In nature, the bees are looking to sustain themselves but not produce any more than what they're doing. Now, it takes approximately one acre of floral like you're seeing to do the bees. Uh, there's two circumstances where we feed bees. It's Darth or if the bees are sick, right? So you're gonna have to learn to feed your bees. If you don't have something like this that you see in these photos, you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to learn feeding habits for your bees, that's, that's pretty important. This is, this is like a field that you would see out where I live. Uh, Josiah came out the one time and the field was just pure yellow, beautiful yellow flowers that were out. And like I said right here, if you don't have something like this, visualize a football field without the end zones. And if you don't have flowers blooming like this, and in the football field like that, you're gonna have problems. You're gonna have to feed your bees. That's how much feed that the bees are gonna to have to have. You know, the amount of food that they make from working, you know, a bee only lives for 36 days, works itself to death for a teardrop of nectar, right? So it takes a lot of nectar to feed these bees. So make sure you're furnishing your gardens, botanical gardens, get downtown, anything that you can where the bees are gonna be accumulated to find food or you're gonna be feeding them a lot. These are ways to feed. Uh, the little one down here on the far right, the little tray with the two liter bottle, those are super awesome. They work in Top Bar, they work in Langstruff, they work in Eco. They're a really super good device and I like them because you can reuse two liter bottles or you can even hook up a hose and hook those all the way up to a five gallon bucket and hook five or six hoses to them. This is a type of feeding device that was originally made in Turkey to feed the bees directly from what we call drip line feeding. But these are now out on Amazon on this, on this is a smaller scale model. The bigger ones were a little drip line that was inside the beehive that you constantly fed the bees the whole time. Uh, the other ones, the, the silver cans that look like soup cans, those are what come in your package bees. You can hang those out in front of your beehive so the bees can get right to them. Hummingbird feeders. You're gonna see thousands of bees at hummingbird feeders. This is even a way to control your bees' flight path, that you can move these hummingbird feeders in directions where the bees come out, do their orientation, get to the nectar flow over here, instead of coming over here where you might have stuff. This is a more direct line to get the bees out of the way. On the top left, that's an inner feeder. That's where we're dumping massive amounts of feed for over the winter or to start off your bees. But most people see the jars, uh, the ones that are there in the center on top of the beehives is what we like. The, the, you can change those jars in and out by walking behind the beehives, but they're called board line feeders. Most of the time you see them in the front of the beehives. 
you know, that's typical, but you have to work in front of your beehive. I'm not a big fan of that. So, but these are just some typical, look at how you're going to feed your bees. There's many different feeding devices. I just wanted to show you a couple different ways. If you don't have the floral, if you don't have a clover field, you're going to have to feed your bees. Your site and your bees. Um, you know, pick out a hive and a beekeeping system. This here is a system that you're seeing here. It's not the system I'm going to use. I'll, I, I'd fall, I, I'll fall off a one-foot step. So I want you to think about set up your site before even getting bees. Make sure you have an open area with sun, that you have a great hive stand, that you have a windbreak, that you have your water source, that you know how you're going to feed your bees and how you're going to keep them out of the pedestrian pathway. Pedestrian pathway is big on the inner city. You want to put uh, a sheet from a trampoline, that netting that goes around it, the bees will fly into that and go up and over. Once the bees reach that altitude, they just don't drop over again. So you can put these barriers up to control the bees, start training your bees. Uh, look into your history. Look about who in your area is beekeeping and what they're using. Take a couple classes. Get oriented with some clubs. Uh, check into some YouTube. Broaden your horizon. Your site, your bees. I get a lot of people say, what, what, what am I doing wrong? I'm not there taking the documentation. I can look at your documentation and help you, but if you're not taking documentation, you're not training your bees, you're not working with them so they get face recognition, your smell, your movement, you're not the beekeeper. You need to be the beekeeper. These are some tips and stuff I have for setting up your apiary. Hopefully a little bit of them you can go through, get some questions uh, going up. Uh, I just want to let you know, and when it is right there it says at the bottom, when people talk about green technology and they talk about solar panels, wind energy and stuff, there isn't anything greener than a beekeeper, man. I want you to always remember that when you talk about ecosystem, you're, you're the one that starts this. Without bees, man, the earth dies in five years. So that's your presentation right there of what we have for bees and setting up your apiary. You don't find some of this information in a book. They talk about some of this stuff, but if you don't really see it, you don't know what you're looking for. And if you're not working with a mentor that's saying, push this beehive against this house a little bit more and let's put up a trellis here so people don't see it and it gets a flight pattern going. You, they're not really showing this in a, in a book. They don't really talk about what, what makes a site. You know, people go out, oh, I'm gonna, I, want, I want it for my garden. I want bees to pollinate my garden. If you set that beehive in your garden, they're never gonna, they're never gonna see the garden. Yeah. You need to get it in a location that's up out of the way and away from that garden so the bees can get up in the air, do the orientation and say, nectar flow, and then move to it. So setting up some of this stuff I think is a little bit different. You know, once you find out that if you can have them, prep your site. And I think this is some of your best stuff to try to prep your site. Are, are they gonna be able to get this PowerPoint presentation? That was actually one of the questions and uh, yeah, we'll get them, we'll send it out via email, we'll add it to the event. To the event so I think, I think if you would review this a little bit, why, look at those PowerPoint and read the comments on the side and incorporate with that with books that you read. Uh, our, our, the program that I teach is you make your own book, that you're the beekeeper. We incorporate things for your site that you're going to use. You may not use some queening aspects that anybody else uses. You may be doing Langstroth and Top Bar. So if you look at these slides and then incorporate some of the stuff that I'm showing you, with your beekeeping skill, it's gonna help you a lot more. And you're gonna kind of see what we're talking, when, when you get out to your apiary or you're working your bees, you say, oh yeah, he, he did say that it's probably better for me to turn the beehive a little bit and I can see why now. Or the neighbor is pretty nosy. I'm surely glad that we put that barrier fence up. Or, you know, I, I teach a course about how to build them in a, in a shed. Yes, they're not gonna get as much light being in the shed, but if the door opening is on the southeast side where the hole is, they're going to know that's the light source coming out. So it's not always about the beehive itself getting the light. It's about them seeing the light at the first part of the day and keeping warm. 